Sunday morning, church. Good morning. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Welcome to worship this morning at First United Methodist Church on this special Sunday. This is Trinity Sunday in our church, where we celebrate the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Before we get started this morning, let's look at our announcements that are in your bulletin and hopefully on the screen, upcoming events. During the month of June, we're collecting money for the Armenia program. Wanda is going back to Armenia, and we're trying to help with the expenses of some of those who are going over there. Uh, tomorrow, Monday at 7 p.m., the United Women of Faith will have a meeting, and the Executive Committee will meet at 6 prior to the meeting. Tuesday is Young at Heart Day at 11 a.m. Uh, Jim Burgess is going to provide the program, and as usual, we're having a great meal. <clears throat> so uh, if you're inclined, come out and join us on Tuesday for Young at Heart. On June the 13th at 10 a.m., the children will go to the gym theater uh, to uh, have some fellowship time and watch a good movie. Uh, so put that on your calendar for your children. Also, it's time to register for Vacation Bible School. And if you are so inclined, Sarah can still use your assistance. So uh, put Vacation Bible School on your schedule as that is a very important ministry of this church, not only for our children, but for those in our community. It is a wonderful outreach program. Are there any other announcements that need to be lifted up at this time? Hearing none, let's, oh, Sue has an announcement. Someone in fellowship time went to get their coffee and left their cane on the counter. If you're missing your cane, it's in the fellowship building next to the coffee machine. <laughs> and I used to do that all the time. <laughs> After my last knee surgery, I finally just decided to quit carrying a cane because I had about four and I could never find any of them because I would leave them at work or leave them somewhere. So I know how that works. Okay, let's begin our worship this morning by standing and singing our opening hymn, Come Christians, Join to Sing. <laughs>
Let us now profess our faith by reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended to heaven and stood at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From this you shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. At this time we ask the ushers to come forward to receive our morning offering. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for the magnificent blessings that you've given us. The greatest blessing of all is the salvation of our soul and the promise of eternity in your kingdom with you. We thank you for the gifts, the tithes, and the offerings. Bless them to the advancement of your kingdom, and we ask your blessing upon the givers. In your holy name we pray. Amen.
time we ask the children to come forward for children's time. sharing his love with your friends. Do you think he loves that? So let's talk about the other one. The next one is to love your neighbor as yourself. How do you love your neighbor? And is your neighbor like your next door neighbor or is it your friend? It could be your next door neighbor, but it also could be your friend too. What, what's the one way you can love your, love your friend? What's one way you can love your friend? Yep. What about sharing? Sharing your favorite toy, that's great, Elizabeth. What about, what about sharing God's love with them? Or what if they're sick? What if you make them a meal? Can you make them have you ever cooked for a friend? Or has your mom or your grandma ever cooked for a friend? One time Nana cooked for Kirby, okay. Is it, is it hard to love God and love your friends sometimes? Is it hard to love your God and love your friends sometimes? Sometimes, yes. It, it's a little difficult. But, but with God's help, we can, we can get through it. So let's say a prayer and then we'll go to children's church. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and thank you for helping us. Teach us how to, <coughs> to share your love and to love our friends. In your son's name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Bye. 
choir. We now lift up our prayer concerns. You see in your bulletin a list of folks who are currently on our prayer list. It's so good to have Johnny Graham and Linda Reed with us this morning. Are there others you would like to add to this prayer list? I know one on my mind is we need to remember the family of Tom Smith, particularly uh, Brenda Seaman, his sister, and Todd and Rhonda and the loss of their uncle. Are there other prayer concerns you'd like to lift up this morning? Uh, my friend Angie Lee, she's having surgery tomorrow. She has breast cancer. All right. Thank you. Are there others? If not, let's go to the Lord for our morning prayer. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you have given us your servant's grace by the confession of our true faith to acknowledge the glory of the eternal trinity and in the power of your divine majesty to worship its unity. Keep us steadfast in this faith that we may evermore be defended from all adversities. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. May Christ be with us. May Christ be within us. May Christ be behind us and before us. May Christ be beside us. Christ to win us. Christ to comfort us and restore us. Christ beneath us. Christ above us. Christ, Christ in the quiet times and meditations of our life. And Christ with us in the dangerous and confusing parts of our life. Christ in the hearts of all that love us, and may Christ and his message be in the mouths of both friend and strangers. In the name of the Christ who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, I would like to introduce to you our preacher for today, Reverend Paul Strand. Paul graduated from Hood Theological Seminary with our own Pastor Kelly. And he's been with us before, and he and Will became good friends through their activities at Camp Tacoa. And it's so good to have Paul bringing us our message this morning. So at this time, Paul, you're in charge. Well, it's wonderful to be back with you guys here this morning. And I bet if you've looked in the bulletin, you're probably wondering what in the world is our sermon title. And you get to that in just a second. I'm not going to ruin it right off the bat for you. <laughs> Let you think about it just a little bit longer. But it's good to be back here at First China Grove. I'm thankful for both Will and Kelly to go on vacation at the same time so I could come be with you guys today. A little selfishness there, but I guess that's okay every once in a while. But let's start out this morning talking about acronyms. And that's one big, long acronym.
for a sermon title today. But in today's world, we love our acronyms. Now, a dictionary defines an acronym as, and I have two definitions for you. The first one is an abbreviation. Nice and simple, right? The second definition is this. A word formed from the initial letters or group of letters of words in a set phrase or series of words and pronounced as a separate word. I'm sticking with the first one, an abbreviation, much simpler. But as I mentioned acronyms, you're probably thinking of a few right now, right in this moment, because we use them every day. And so I asked my family, what are some acronyms that you use all the time? And so these are a few that I got. So LOL, laugh out loud, BRB, be right back, G2G, good to go, Um, BOGO, buy one, get one, free, Um, AWOL for those military people out there, absent without leaves. Um, One they use in work is OOO, out of office. So there's many of them out there that we use every single day. And there's many, many more out there where we could spend hours upon hours just listing them off. And I even bet you have your own favorite acronym that you like to use. Even in our workplaces, we have our, each workplace has their own unique set of acronyms. At my employer, we have a section of our intranet purely dedicated to acronyms. And some of the acronyms actually have 10 plus meetings within the same company. It can be kind of confusing at times, can't it? Even in our church communities, we use acronyms. NT for New Testament, OT for Old Testament, SS for Sunday School. I know one group that, one youth group that like to call themselves Dog Shed. Doesn't sound very good at first, does it? But you deal with youth for one thing, so that should be a clue that it probably has better meaning, uh, underlying meaning. And what it stood for is depend on God, spreading hope every day. Brings a different meaning to it, doesn't it? But my personal favorite is WWJD. What would Jesus do? It's a movement that started a few years back. A youth director innovator started in the 1990s after reading a book from 1896 titled In His Steps by the Reverend Charles Sheldon. Now, Reverend Sheldon wanted to emphasize the need for Christians to act like and imitate Jesus. So he referenced what would Jesus do. Now the youth director modified what would Jesus do to an acronym because she felt it would be easier for the youth to remember and act upon. And then from there it's just history. The WWJD movement went crazy. And I'm sure there's many of us in here who have worn a WWJD bracelet. Maybe they have a WWJD sign in their car or at home in their office or someplace like that. But WWJD gave us a tool on how to determine what to do in a particular situation by imitating Jesus. So let's look at an example to see how we might be able to respond to a situation and see if we may be able to apply WWJD. So there's a guy at the top of an x trap holding a sign, homeless vet, hungry, need food and fuel. Please help. He's wearing worn out clothes, but you think you recognize this person cause, and you saw him less than an hour ago at a gas station. Only he had very nice brand name clothes on. And he was driving a 2023 decked out Corvette. And you recently saw a story on the news how a panhandler in Charlotte cleared over $80,000 a year tax free. So what do you do? Do you give this person money? Or do you avoid eye contact and drive right by? So you ask yourself, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Now, the interesting part of you asking yourself what Jesus would do is that you still have to make it determined what you think Jesus would have done. And are you making the correct choice? Are you confident in what Jesus would actually do? Maybe you're running late, and so that may influence you on what you think Jesus would do. The pressure's on. What do you do? But don't worry. 
I have an acronym for that. It's going to help us in this situation. And the acronym is J-W-P-N-H-G-H-I-T-S-I-T-F-P. Jesus probably would not have gotten himself into this situation in the first place. There's a test on what the acronym means after this. If you could come up with a word for that, let me know. Jesus would not have to stop and think about what he should or should not do. Jesus would just do. Now, if we look at the great commandment in Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 34, it gives us a guide on how we should respond so we do not have to stop and ask WWJD. And this is what our scripture says. Again, this is Mark 12, 28 to 34. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which one is the most important? The most important one, Jesus answered, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. Well said. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one, and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, and with all your strength, and to love the neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now I'm going to simplify this. I'm not going to make it into an acronym, but I'm going to simplify it. We can simplify it into this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. If we live by this simple statement, there will never be a question on how we should respond. So let's look at three points that will help us understand what is embedded into the scripture so we will never have to ask ourselves WWJD or consider J-W-P-N-H-G-H-I-T-S-I-T-F-P. The first point is this. Loving your neighbor is a response to loving your God. Now, do we really want to love our neighbor? After all, they're not normal like we are. And then the next question becomes, who is your neighbor? But that's a sermon for another day. The bottom line is that the scripture calls for us to love our neighbor. But how does loving our neighbor become a response to loving our God? Now, the first thing we need to remember is that the Bible has everything we need for our salvation. The scripture tells us we are to love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And it is our faith in Jesus Christ that brings us our salvation with God. Our faith in Jesus is the way we show our love to God. Our faith in Jesus transforms us, and we begin to do those things that God created us to do. And one of the things we do in response to our faith is loving our neighbor. Now, Jesus demonstrated this type of love in response to the Samaritan woman. Now, Jesus stopped in a small town in Samaria to rest by a well while the disciples went into town to purchase some food. As Jesus was resting, a woman came to the well to fetch some water, and he asked her for a drink. Now, she was surprised at his request because Jews did not associate with Samaritans. Loving our neighbor is, loving our neighbor is all about teaching those Let me start over. Loving our neighbor is all about reaching out to those who are different than us, putting our biases aside, and showing them the love of Christ. It does not mean we have to agree with them. It does not mean we have to agree with what they're doing. It does not mean we have to like them. What it does mean is we are to show them the love of Christ 
in our actions and our words. I was going to ask you this question. So the man panhandling at the top of the off ramp, what should he do? Second point is this. It's not as simple and easy as it may seem. When you say love God and love neighbor, it sounds pretty simple. It actually is not simple at all. Loving God is more than coming to a church on Sunday for an hour or so. Loving God is about living the life that God created you to live. I stress you specifically because God gives each of us different spiritual gifts. And as a result, God created each of us to do and live a little bit differently. So as we live the life that God created us to live, our neighbors end up being part of our lives. Now I'm sure all of our neighbors are perfect. They have no flaws, and there's absolutely nothing about your neighbor that bugs you. Does everyone agree with that statement? I'm glad you're hearing some chuckles because I highly doubt it. Because our neighbors have a tendency to do what they want to do, not what we want them to do. But as we attempt to love our neighbors, as God has called us to do, there are outside forces that will influence our actions. Some of these outside forces may be things like our family and friends, our co-workers, or position of a large corporation we may work for, television shows, news media, social media. You have your own personal biases. And last but not, definitely not least, we have a relationship with God. How we interpret the Bible and how it relates to our salvation will influence us. The theology of the denomination and church we go to will influence us. And how you follow the scripture in the Bible and the teachings of Jesus is going to influence you. But putting some of these influence of others aside and putting aside our own personal biases is important and necessary to show our neighbors the love of Christ. Again, it's not easy. It does not mean we need to agree with what they're doing. It's not something that we can do on our own. If you ask God for help and depend on God to help you put those influences aside, it is possible. And as we ask God for assistance, we begin to show our neighbors the love of Christ and we, we will begin to see our neighbors as a child of God. So I'm asking you the question again. The man panhandling at the top of the off-ramp, what do you do? My third point is this, is living the great commandment is a lifestyle. Now, dictionary.com defines lifestyle as the habits, attitudes, tastes, and moral, moral standards and economic level that together constitute the mode of living of an individual or group. So what this definition tells us is that if we are to love God and love neighbor as Jesus teaches us to do, our habits, attitudes, tastes, moral standards must reflect love of God and love of neighbor. Now loving God and loving neighbor is not a once a week thing. Simply going to church every Sunday will not get you to place where Jesus calls you to be. Doing it while you are at home and on the weekends, but not in the workplace will not get you where you need to be. In order to love God and to love neighbor as Jesus calls us to live, it must be of every second, of every minute, of every hour, of every day. So the next logical question is this. How do we get there? Well, first thing we need to recognize is that it's not instantaneous. Getting to love God and to love neighbor as a lifestyle takes over time. It starts out by going to church. It continues as we get involved in different church groups like study groups and Sunday school groups and continues to evolve as we get involved in outreach and mission activities. As your Christian journey continues and your faith continues to progress, you slowly become that person that God created you to be. As you become that person, you begin to love God and love neighbor as Jesus teaches us. The bottom line 
is that loving God and loving neighbor becomes so embedded in your life that it begins to define who you are as a person. The way you live your life reflects love of God and love of neighbor. So let's go back to our panhandling friends at the top of the off-ramp. If we are not living our life wholeheartedly in love of God and love neighbor, we will use facts that we think are relative to to the situation. We may think we have seen this person at the gas station in different clothes and driving a decked out sports car. In addition, we have the outside influence of the news media giving a story on a panhandler on how one person brought $80,000 home. We end up disregarding the fact it, we disregard the fact that a news media story, a story was not on this particular person. And we disregard the fact there's a high probability that the person at the top of the off-ramp is not the person at the gas station. Now if we take the assumed piece of information in consideration, it allows us to put the information together in a way that allows us to rationalize that we should not help this person. That was easy. We're off the hook. We don't have to help this person. I like that we, how we could easily rationalize that and get out of it. But when we love God and love neighbor's lifestyle, absolutely none of that matters. All that matters is that this person was made in the image of God. All that matters is that this person is a child of God. Nothing else is relevant. Nothing else matters. The person deserves to receive assistance, and we are called to help this person. By helping this person, we are loving God and loving neighbor. Now, WWJD is a great tool to help us in a Christian journey. I'm not telling you not to use it. It is a great tool. But at some point, we need to remove beyond the reactive state of WWJD and get to a place where we are reacting to people's needs as part of who we are. When we get to this state, we are where Jesus is currently, and we will not have to remind ourselves of WWJD Remind ourselves of J-W-P-N-H-G-H-I-T-S-I-T-F-P. Jesus would not have gotten himself into this situation in the first place. Will you pray with me? Our gracious God, we thank you for the time together this morning. We thank you for the message. And we... Help us recognize that this is not something that we can do on our own. Loving God and loving neighbor as part of who we are is something that we need your help with. So we're here this morning asking for your help. May the Holy Spirit come down upon us and help us be the person that God created us to be. Where nothing else matters other than someone is created in your image and that they are a child of God. And therefore, they deserve our help. And our help will show them the love of Christ that we so received in our faith. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much, Reverend Paul. We appreciate that. Our closing hymn is a charge to keep, I have. Let's stand.
Now hear this benediction. God's arms are open and Jesus is calling. Jesus is calling you to be the person that God created you to be. So leave your day knowing that you can be that person. You can achieve what we would call Christian perfection with God's help. So go out and show the world God's love and who you are, that person God created you to be. So go in peace, serve the Lord, and thanks be to God. Amen.